Welcome to From the Quarries. Tonight's video, The Apron, is an extract from the book Blue Lodge Masonry by Brother H. L. Haywood, which was first published in 1918. I must admit I'm not a huge fan of everything that Brother Haywood has to say in this text. He tends to be very literalist and rejects outright a number of things that I hold quite dear. Nevertheless, his analysis is very precise and I think is of value. I hope you enjoy it. Good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. Come we now to the apron. Having been privileged to read up and down a great deal of Masonic literature, I may say that on no other one symbol has so much nonsense been written. It has been made to mean a thousand and one things, from the fig leaf worn by Adam and Eve to the last mathematical theory of the fourth dimension, and there is little cause to wonder that the intelligent have been scandalised and the common men bewildered. If an interpretation can be made that steers a safe course between the folly of the learned and the fanaticism of the ignorant, it will have some value, whatever may be said of its own intrinsic worth. Warned by the many who have fallen into the pit of unreason, we shall be wise to walk warily and theorise carefully. Speaking generally, and without the slightest hint of disrespect to our fellow workers in this field, it may be said that a majority of the wildest theories have been based on the shape of the apron, a thing of comparatively recent origin and due to a mere historical accident. The body of it, as now worn, is approximately square in shape and has thus suggested the symbolism of the square, the right angle and the cube and all arising therefrom. Its flap is triangular, and this has suggested the symbolism of the triangle, the 47th proposition, and the pyramid. The descent of the flap over the body of the apron has also given rise to reasonings equally ingenious. By this method of interpretation, men have read into it all manner of things, the mythology of the mysteries, the metaphysics of India, the dream-walking of the Kabbalah, and the occultisms of magic. Meanwhile, it has been forgotten that the apron is a Masonic symbol, and that we are to find out what it is intended to mean, rather than what it may, under the stress of our lust for fancifulness, be made to mean. When the ritual is consulted, as it always deserves to be, we find that it treats the apron, one, as an inheritance from the past, two, as the badge of a mason, and three, as the emblem of innocence and sacrifice. One, the apron is an inheritance from the past. For one purpose or another, and in some form, the apron has been in use for three or four thousand years. In at least one of the ancient mysteries, that of Mithras, the candidate was invested with a white apron. So was the initiate of the Essenes, who received it during the first year of his membership in that order, and it is significant that many of the statues of Greek and Egyptian gods were so ornamented as may still be seen. Chinese secret societies, in many cases, also used it, and the Persians, at one time, employed it as their national banner. Jewish prophets often wore aprons, as ecclesiastical dignitaries of the present day still do. As Brother J. G. Gibson has remarked, wherever the religious sentiment remains, there has been noticed the desire of the natives to wear a girdle or apron of some kind. From all this, however, we must not infer that our Masonic apron has come to us from such sources, though, for all we know, 
the early builder may have been influenced by those ancient and universal customs. The fact seems to be that the operative masons used the apron only for the practical purpose of protecting the clothing, as there was need in labour so rough. It was nothing more than one item of the workman's necessary equipment, as is shown by Brother H. W. Rylands, who found an indenture of 1865 in which a master contracted to supply his apprentice with sufficient and wholesome and competent meat, drink, lodging and aprons. Because the apron was so conspicuous a portion of the operative mason's costume and so persistent a portion of his equipment, it was inevitable that speculatives should have continued its use for symbolical purposes. The earliest known representatives of these, we are informed by Brother J. F. Crow, who was one of the first of our scholars to make a thorough and scientific investigation of the subject, is an engraved portrait of Anthony Sayer. Only the upper portion is visible in the picture, but the flap is raised, and the apron looks like a very long leathern skin. The next drawing is in the frontispiece of the Book of Constitution, published in 1723, where a brother is represented as bringing a number of aprons and gloves into the lodge, the former appearing of considerable size and with long strings. In Hogarth's cartoon, Night, drawn in 1737, the two Masonic figures, Crow points out in another connection, have aprons reaching to their ankles, but other plates of the same period show aprons reaching only to the knee, thus marking the beginning of that process of shortening and of general decrease in size and change in shape, which finally gave us the apron of the present day. For since the garment no longer serves as a means of protection, it has been found wise to fashion it in a manner more convenient to wear, not that this is inconsistent with its original Masonic significance. It is this fact, as I have already suggested, that has made the present form of the apron a result of circumstances, and proves how groundless are the interpretations founded on its shape. According to Blue Lodge usages in the United States, the apron must be of unspotted lambskin, 14 to 16 inch inches in width, 12 to 14 inches in depth, with a flap descending from the top some 3 or 4 inches. The Grand Lodge of England now specifies such an apron as this for the first degree, but requires the apron of the second degree to have two sky blue rosettes at the bottom and that of the third degree, to have, in addition to that, a sky-blue lining and edging, not more than two inches deep, and an additional rosette on the fall or flap, and silver tassels. Grand officers are permitted to use other ornaments, gold embroidery, and in some cases, crimson edgings. All the evidence goes to show that these ornate aprons are of recent origin. The apron should always be worn outside the coat. 2. The Badge of a Mason The thick tanned hide girt around him with thongs, wherein the builder builds, and at evening sticks his trowel, was so conspicuous a portion of the costume of the operative mason that it became associated with him in the public mind, and this gradually evolved into his badge for a badge is some mark voluntarily assumed as a result of established custom whereby one's work or station or school of opinion may be signified. Of what is the Mason's badge a mark? Surely its history permits but one answer to this. It is the mark of honourable and conscientious labour, the labour that is devoted to creating to constructing rather than to destroying or demolishing. As such, the mason's apron is itself a symbol of profound change in the attitude of society towards work, for the labour of hand and brain, once despised by the great of the earth, is rapidly becoming one of the badges of an honourable life. If men were once proud to wear a sword 
while leaving the tasks of life to slaves and menials, if they once sought titles and coats of arms as emblems of distinction. They are now, figuratively speaking, eager to wear the apron, for the knight of the present day would rather save life than take it, and prefers it a thousand times over, the glory of achievement to the glory of title or name. Truly, the rank has become that guinea stamp, and a man's a man for all that, especially if he be a man that can do, and the real modern king, as Carlyle was always contending, is the man who can. If this is the message of the apron, none has a better right to wear it than a mason, if he be a real member of the craft, for he is a knight of labour if ever there was one. Not all labour deals with things. There is a labour of the mind, of the spirit, more arduous, often and more difficult than any labour of the hands. He who dedicates himself to the cleaning of the Augean stables of the world, to the clearing away of the rubbish that litters the path of life, to the fashioning of building stones in the confused quarries of mankind, is entitled more than any man to wear the badge of toil. 3. An Emblem of Innocence and Sacrifice When the candidate is invested with a garment, he is told that it is an emblem of innocence. It is doubtful if operative lodgers ever used it for such a symbolic purpose, although they may have done so in the 17th century, after speculatives began to be received in greater numbers. The evidence indicates that it was after the Grand Lodge era, and in consequence of the rule, that the apron should be of white lambskin, that masons began to see its colour as an emblem of innocence, and in its texture a suggestion of sacrifice. In doing so, they fell into line with ancient practices, for of old, white has been esteemed an emblem of innocence and purity. Among the Romans, an accused person would sometimes put on a garment of white to attest his innocence, white being, as Cicero phrased it, most acceptable to the gods. The candidates in the Mysteries and among the Essenes were similarly invested, and it has the same meaning of purity and innocence in the Bible, which promises that though our skins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. In the early Christian church, the young catechumen, or convert, robed himself in white as a token of his abandonment of the world and his determination to lead a blameless life. But there is no need to multiply instances, for each of us feels by instinct that white is the natural symbol of innocence. Now it happens that innocence comes from a word meaning to do no hurt, and this may well be taken as its Masonic definition, for it is evident that no grown man can be innocent in the sense that a child is, which really means an ignorance of evil. The innocence of a mason is his gentleness, his chivalrous determination to do no moral evil to any person, man or woman, or babe, his patient forbearance of the crudeness and ignorance of men, his charitable forgiveness of his brethren when they willfully or unconsciously do him evil, his dedication to a spiritual knighthood in behalf of the values and virtues of humanity by which alone man rises above the brute and the world is carried forward on the upward sway. It is in token of this texture, lambskin, that we find in the apron further significance of sacrifice. And this also, it seems, is a symbolism developed since 1700. It has been generally believed, until recently, that the operatives used only leather aprons, and this was doubtless the case in the early days. But Crow has shown that many of the oldest lodge records evidence a use of linen as well. In the old lodge of Melrose, he writes, dating back to the 17th century, the aprons have always been of linen, and the same rule obtained in Mary's Chapel No. 1, Edinburgh, 
the oldest lodge in the world. Whilst Brother James Smithy, in his history of the old Dumfries Lodge, writes, On inspecting the box of Lodge 53, there was only one apron of kid or leather, the rest being of linen. As these lodges are of greater antiquity than any in England, I think a fair case is made for our linen versus leather originally. It cannot be said, however, that Brother Crow has entirely made out his case, for other authorities contend that the builders who necessarily handled rough stone and heavy timbers must have needed a more substantial fabric than linen or cotton. But, in any event, the fraternity has been using leather aprons for these two centuries, though cotton cloth is generally substituted for ordinary lodge purposes. And it is in no sense far-fetched to see in the lambskin a hint of that sacrifice of which the lamb has so long been an emblem. But what do we mean by sacrifice? To answer this fully would lead us far afield into ethics and theology. But for our present purpose, we may say that the Mason's sacrifice is the cheerful surrender of all that is in him which is unmasonic. If he has been too proud to meet others on the level, he must lay aside his pride. If he has been too mean to act upon the square, he must yield up his meanness. If he has been guilty of corrupting habits, they must be abandoned, or else his wearing of the apron be a fraud and a sham. Carrying with it so rich a freightage of symbolism, the apron may justly be considered more ancient than the golden fleece or Roman eagle, more honourable than the star and the garter. For these badges were, too often, nothing more than the devices of flattery and the insignia of an empty name. The golden fleece was an order of knighthood founded by Philip, Duke of Burgundy, on the occasion of his marriage to the infant infanta Isabella of Portugal, in 1429 or 1430. It used a golden ram for its badge, and the motto inscribed on its jewel was Wealth, not servile labour. The Romans of old bore an eagle on their banners to symbolise magnanimity, fortitude, swiftness and courage. The Order of the Star originated in France in 1350, being founded by John II in imitation of the Order of the Garter. Of the last-named order, it is difficult to speak, as its origin is clothed in so much obscurity that historians differ. But it was as essentially aristocratic as any of the others. In every case, the emblem was a token of aristocratic idleness and aloofness, the opposite of that symbolised by the apron and the superiority of of the latter over the former is too obvious for comment. For more Masonic content, visit fromthequarries.com or subscribe to our YouTube, Twitter or Facebook accounts.